Um, you're libertarians, I'm conservative, we intersect with each other. Um, I sometimes think libertarians have slightly excessive enthusiasm for, uh, uh, for um, salvation. So I think you need to be aware that political idealism is a very dangerous kind of thing. Um, you will have realized my subject is absurd. Uh, and therefore, all I can do is provide you with a sketch of a position. Um, uh, part of the reason for my paper is that um, libertarianism and individualism are both under current attack <coughs> as being selfish and indifferent to the common good. In the Sunday Telegraph, uh, I think last week, we have a headline, Britain, the world's most selfish society, and it is making us depressed. I hope you are not depressed. Anyway, um, I think that we need to respond to the situation with something a little bit more sophisticated than Hayek and Adam Smith and the glories of the free market. So let me move on to defining political idealism. By which I mean, quite simply, any belief that we can find a better system of society than the one we have. Uh, and the key word there is the word system. It is the belief that human beings always live within a system. And a system is a set of interrelated parts that always produce a reliable outcome. Um, political idealists commonly think that we live already in a system, and therefore the point is to find a better system. The system we are thought to live in is called capitalism. Uh, the better system is often called, well, socialism is one of the many variants of it. Nationalism was another one. Uh, the view that if only the empires of the world could be broken up and uh, humanity was a set of discrete totally independent national units all governing themselves, this would, um, would be a better world. Or the um, Adolf Hitler's um, view that um, there is a racial hierarchy in the world which has been confused by a number of vile and uh, ideological people, most of them Jews, and if only we could get the racial uh, hierarchy straight, then we would live in a better world. That's a different system which he tried to, uh, to bring about. So the vogue for systems is, um, can I think be dated fairly precisely to the thing called the Enlightenment. So let me plug it in to the legend of the Enlightenment. I say legend because what the Enlightenment is, is a major question of um, dispute amongst historians in many ways. But I think somewhere around 1700, uh, a lot of people, particularly um, um, intelligentsia, advanced thinkers and so on, abandoned the belief that we lived in a fallen world, the belief you get from Genesis and so on, and moved into the idea that we don't live in a fallen world, we live in an imperfect society. And here were a set of people who were developing a technological civilization of great force. And what you do with imperfections is you get rid of them. So the project became creating a better system than the one that we already had. And the history of European politics since about 1700 is, I think, the history of people with new, new conceptions of what a good system would be, um, trying to bring it about. What this meant was that politics moved into two gears. Whereas previously there was the ordinary governing uh, project of kings and ministers in which they sustained whatever beliefs about justice they had and they fought wars and they grabbed territory and did all the usual things that states did and had been doing. But secondly, there was another level of politics at which there was a hope that um, the levers of power could be seized by people who took seriously the idea 
of a new and better system. And obviously, the French Revolution was the first great triumph of this political idealism, and so was the Bolshevik Revolution and many other revolutions that have happened since. We thus need, according to political idealists, a better society. The question then becomes, what constitutes a better society? You can do this, you can answer that question either empirically by looking at what most societies are like, but I shall take the short a priori shortcut. Most people living in societies live on the edges of starvation, they've got lots of enemies, uh, life is pretty unsatisfactory, they have to work too hard for what they get and all the rest of it. <coughs> what they basically want is to live within a harmony, a harmonious society. What is the key to a harmonious society? Well, it must be managed from the top to the bottom so that you have a ruler at the top uh, who has the right ideas and then you have intermediate stages right down to the family. And the family is a rule usually by men, but then the men rule the women and children, but then the women run the children and then the uh, elder children run the younger children. So, in other words, this is a system in which nearly everybody, unless you're at the bottom of the heap like a slave, has some sort of power. Somebody is above you and somebody is below you. This is a hierarchical world. It is based upon the idea that there is one right order within which everybody should live. And this one right order is given usually in the religion of the, um, uh, of the particular society. It's given also, of course, in the customs. And it's given, above all, in the power which is exercised by the ruler of um, such a society. Now, these societies are maybe illustrated by almost any tribal society you care to mention. Tribes, I take it, are uh, relatively small groups of people who have managed to find a way of uh, living which is ideally adapted to whatever their physical circumstances are. They may be desert or they may be uh, ice or arctic circumstances, but these are usually quite small. They don't have a written language. They have very little capacity for abstract thought. And these are today known as indigenous peoples. They're estimated, I think, at about 250 million of them. But the more impressive civilizations that belong to what I'm calling the, 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 the one right order societies would be illustrated by the Muslim Sharia, uh, by the Hindu caste system, four basic castes, but I think there are said to be over 200 in practice, there are many variations on the caste system. The, um, the obedience structure of imperial China, in which uh, the elder always had um, um, authority over the younger. Indeed, authority is, authority is a European word. Politics is a European word. It's very hard to give an account of what these civilizations were like without using words which put you slightly to one side. You get it slightly wrong. You see, there's no politics in one sense anywhere else except in the European world. Uh, and politics emerged during feudalism and after feudalism and so on. It comes out of uh, Roman civil association and, um, and uh, the republics of, of, the, of the Greek classical age. But these um, societies that I'm talking about are all, I think, despotisms. Some enlightened, some less enlightened. They have been immensely powerful and often very much richer than, uh, than Western Europe. And they're all very impressive. But they have certain limits which are different from the limits with which we are familiar. Um, Now, 
we might ask the question, do we in the West have a drive towards ideal political systems, towards one right order of things? And the answer is, yes, indeed we do. We have lots of them. And that is the essential point which distinguishes uh, European societies, I think, from any other uh, kind of societies. Um, in the 20th century, we acquired in the form of ideologies a whole set of um, beliefs that were expected to transform the world, in particularly, I mean, you'll be totally familiar with this in Russia, uh, in, in China, in Cambodia, in Cuba, in lots of other places. These were all new systems which were expected to be better and were usually dramatically and murderously worse than anything that happened in our own dear Anglo-Saxon and more broadly speaking European world. Now the question then becomes how do we characterize our own civilization? What is the difference between Western civilization on the one hand and what I'm suggesting to you is virtually the rest of the world uh, which has grown up in terms of one notion of one right order of things. And I think I would want to characterize our civilization as being ambivalent. That is to say, we are accustomed to having very various and different opinions about nearly everything. Institutions, um, attitudes, peoples, races, uh, the economy, religions. We have disagreement about all of them. This is a highly contested world uh, in which we live. Less contested, I think, than it used to be, but it's, um, it's, it's pretty notably um, um, full of conflict in a way in which one right order societies are not. The point about one right order societies is that um, goodness is fitting in with the order and badness or evil is deviation from it. Um, in our moral world um, that simple uh, distinction does not fully operate. I mean we distinguish between legal and illegal and moral and immoral categories. These days, sometimes, God help us, we distinguish between the acceptable and the unacceptable. But by and large, there are so many opinions on all of this subject that nobody uh, can possibly lay down the law. The point is that we have created a civil order. That is to say, an order um, whose relationships do not in the least depend upon agreeing with the people we talk to. Indeed, you can go one stage further and you can say that we have a certain taste for dealing with independent other people. If they're not uh, independent, the other people we talk to, we regard